Hello, my name is William Kalpas, and in this presentation, I'm going to discuss the efforts at Raytheon BBN Technologies to develop a control system for superconducting qubits that utilizes direct microwave synthesis. To see why this would be desirable, we can examine a typical equipment setup used for controlling and reading out a superconducting qubit. An arbitrary waveform generator is used to create pulse envelopes which are mixed up with a highly stable microwave carrier and amplified, filtered, or attenuated before entering the dilution refrigerator. However, there are a few fundamental issues lying in each component of this system. The mixers tend to have unstable electrical characteristics that fluctuate with time and with temperature, and even when these are calibrated out, the carrier and opposite sideband can still leak through. The local oscillators tend to be expensive due to the strict noise requirements, and the arbitrary waveform generators typically have a small bandwidth limited memory, and minimal control capabilities, prohibiting complex operations such as quantum error correction. Furthermore, such a setup requires four channels of the waveform generator, which can necessitate a dedicated instrument for each qubit. This can quickly get expensive and prohibit scaling to a few, let alone many, qubits. To solve these issues, we might ask whether we can create a system that naturally operates in the microwave band where qubit and resonator frequencies lie, and directly synthesize the control and readout pulses. Arbitrary waveform generators capable of synthesizing signals up to tens of gigahertz do exist and have been shown to be capable of qubit control, but many of these systems are not economical for widespread integration and still suffer from the limitations of normal waveform generators, minus the bandwidth limitation. Instead, we aim to create a device that operates naturally at a few gigahertz, but can still synthesize tones in that band. So this can be done by exploiting a fundamental property of sampled signals. Suppose we have some continuous signal x of t, which we'd like to generate using a digital to analog converter, or DAC, by assigning the output voltage to take on the value of the signal at equally spaced time intervals. For a system generating samples at an angular frequency omega s, we define Nyquist zones as consecutive regions in frequency space having a bandwidth of one half of omega s, with the first Nyquist zone spanning dc to omega s over 2, the second spanning omega s over 2 to omega s, and so on. If we assume that the spectrum of our signal is located entirely in the first Nyquist zone, the result is that the signal spectrum is copied an infinite number of times, with spectral components present in each Nyquist zone. As long as the analog bandwidth of the DAC is wide enough, these components can be utilized. Now, there is a slight trade-off. When the DAC presents voltage samples at its output, the behavior of how the voltage persists between samples, which is sometimes referred to as a hold profile or reconstruction waveform, creates a frequency-dependent attenuation. Many DACs use a zero-order hold, also referred to as non-return to zero, denoted NRZ in the diagram, in which the voltage of a sample is held constant until the next sample. However, by using a DAC that allows a choice of different reconstruction waveforms, we can push power into the Nyquist zones we care about. I'll discuss numerics in a minute, but for all of the experiments discussed in this talk, we use mix mode, in which the voltage is held constant for half of the sampling interval and then inverted for the remaining half. This pushes most of the power into the second and third Nyquist zones, which is the relevant region of interest for our qubits. To implement this technique in a custom system called the Third Generation Arbitrary Pulse Sequencer, or APS3. We combine off-the-shelf hardware with custom FPGA gateware developed at BBN tailored for superconducting qubit experiments. Some of the unique features include an embedded superscalar processor for fast and conditional execution of complex waveform sequences, as well as internal digital mixers with up to four numerically controlled oscillators, or NCOs, for coherent control of multiple qubits from a single channel. The hardware consists of an FPGA and RF DAC on an industrial module produced by Vedatech. The DAC has an update rate of 5 GHz and accepts a 2.5 gigasample per second complex data stream, which can be further upconverted numerically with an internal NCO. The analog bandwidth of the DAC is 7.5 GHz, allowing reliable microwave synthesis in the second and third Nyquist zones. Each module has two RF outputs and a variety of digital inputs and outputs for triggering. The chassis powering the module is a 1U rack chassis also from Vedatech, which can hold up to five modules for a total of 10 channels accessible over gigabit ethernet. So we can take a look at how the APS3 output compares to a conventional upconversion system by examining the spectrum of a synthesized tone. Looking at the top plot, 
we can clearly see that the RF barrier leaks through along with the lower sideband, as well as some higher order nonlinearities due to the non ideal nature of the mixer. As shown in the middle plot, we can try to calibrate against this by measuring the output at regular intervals to compensate for fluctuations and adjusting our tones accordingly. But even then, the leakage still occurs and additional undesired tones appear. The output of the APS-3 is shown in the bottom plot, and we can see that the vicinity of the desired tone is very clean. Since the pulses do not need to be mixed, there are no additional nonlinearities, and the pulse, phase, and amplitude remain very stable. Since the DAC is clocked at 5 GHz, we can clearly see the additional signal from the other Nyquist zone. To put numbers to this, we can measure the spurious free dynamic range of each configuration, which measures the ratio of the signal strength of the desired tone to that of the strongest spurious emission. This is displayed in the lower right plot, where the search bandwidth for spurious tones is restricted to 500 MHz. Otherwise, this metric would always include the tone in the other Nyquist zone and artificially diminish it, as can be seen near the center. Neglecting this, we can see that the spurious free dynamic range of the APS-3 clearly exceeds that of an up-conversion setup due to the lack of nonlinear effects and higher harmonics. Additionally, we characterize the signal strength of the output as a function of frequency and observe the frequency-dependent roll-off inherent to mix-mode DAC operation. So with this in mind, the next question is whether or not we can control or read out a qubit with this. For this experiment, we assembled an analog front end for the APS-3 to selectively amplify control pulses located around 5.3 GHz, but attenuate readout pulses located around 6.5 GHz. Additionally, the readout path is split so that the reflected measurement pulse can be mixed down with the original measurement pulse and then digitized on a PC. We connect the setup to a qubit on a 5 transmon IBM device located at the base of a blue force dilution refrigerator and perform standard coherence measurements. Compared to previous measurements taken using an upconversion based setup, the coherence times are not diminished. We also characterize the error per gate using randomized benchmarking and still observe comparable results. We disciplined the DAC clock with a Stanford Rubidium standard and we were initially concerned as to whether the DAC would be able to adequately lock onto its phase or produce additional noise, but our results indicate that this is not an issue. To further establish the capability of the APS-3 to perform relevant qubit operations, we'd like to measure whether we can perform a two-qubit entangling gate. Based on the architecture of our device, we perform an all-microwave C-naught gate through the cross-resonance interaction in which the control qubit is driven at the target qubit frequency to create a control state dependent rotation on the target. An X gate applied to the control halfway through the target frequency pulse isolates the ZX term in the Hamiltonian and a virtual phase update on the control and X rotation on the target make it a C naught. We also modify our analog front end to be more conservative with microwave components and split control and readout into separate channels for each qubit. Carrying out this experiment shows that we can successfully apply c naught gates with error rates comparable to what we expect for this device as measured using a conventional setup. As with single qubit gates, error rates are not diminished compared to previous results, and stable gates can be generated for a wide range of pulse lengths. Being able to switch between NCOs in under 4 nanoseconds, as well as a wide channel bandwidth, allows for persistent coherence between the control and multiple targets allowing this control architecture to be applicable to more highly connected quantum processor topologies. In summary, microwave synthesis in higher Nyquist zones is an effective technique for creating economical qubit control systems. The unique features of the BBN APS system, such as an embedded processor and internal NCOs, combined with the wide analog bandwidth of the RF DAC, greatly simplify complex experiments with a wide range of pulse shapes. Further applications could include experiments with higher excited states of the transmon and experiments with pulse shapes that require a wide bandwidth, such as for optimal control. Other future developments for the system include direct RF digitization and in-system integration of the analog front end. Thank you very much for watching, and please feel free to contact me with any questions or comments.